All right. Good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to our panel on nutrition labels for news, uh, how standards uh, can help our media ecosystem. Uh, my name is Natalie Turvey. I'm president of the Canadian Journalism Foundation. Uh, we're a not-for-profit based in Canada. Uh, we've been around for 30 years providing programs that support better journalism and highlight the critical role news plays in a healthy democracy. Over the last year, uh, we've launched a news literacy program in 98% of school boards across the country in collaboration with Civics, uh, a civic engagement organization, uh, in the lead up to our federal election in the fall. Uh, credibility standards and trust indicators are very much top of mind uh, for the foundation uh, as we look at collaborative approaches to tackling information disorder and looking at models that we can import uh, in our programs and, and, and elevate um, to better serve the public in understanding the information they're consuming. I'm joined by uh, some incredibly smart people on stage, and I'd love for them just to take a moment to introduce themselves uh, before we set the stage for our conversation. Can we start? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Dan Gilmore. Uh, actually, before I say anything, I wanted to just say the staff who put these things on are amazing people and don't get nearly enough credit for the hard work they do. Thank you so much for that. And, and I should point out, maybe the hardest working people in the room are in that booth who are doing simultaneous translation, and they deserve a lot of credit, too. Thank you. So, uh, I'm, I'm Dan Gilmore. I'm uh, co-founder of the Aris Arizona State uh, University News Collab. It's a collaborative lab based at the uh, Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications, working on approaches uh, to information in communities uh, at the uh, demand side more than the supply side, thinking about uh, the responsibilities of us as opposed to the people who supply information and ways we can work together across organizations to help improve that ecosystem. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dwight Nell. I'm program lead for the Credibility Coalition. And uh, I would just like to say right off the bat that first of all, the staff is, is terrific. Thanks Dan for pointing that out. And this is, thank you all for coming to a 10 a.m. panel on Saturday morning. We really appreciate, we know all of you were out very late last night, so we really, really appreciate you getting up early to come hear us uh, speak. And uh, this is the most beautiful room I've ever spoken in. Hmm. Uh, so this is just stunning, and it's, yeah. a, it's a pleasure to be here. I want so, that ceiling for my <laughs> So uh, the Credibility Coalition, I'm going to explain uh, more formally in a little bit, but we're an interdisciplinary community, uh, journalists, researchers, technologists, uh, really coming together to, to figure out um, what constitutes credible versus non-credible news and information on the web. Uh, and... Uh, and I don't want to say too much about it now because we're going to, uh, uh, like I said, I'm going to dive into it in a few minutes, but, uh, but that's who we are. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Joan Donovan. I'm the director of the Technology and Social Change Research Project at uh, the Shorenstein Center at Harvard Kennedy School. Um, again, yes, thank you for everyone coming out this early and for staff having everything set up. Uh, I was really excited about this panel because... Um, I think this is one of the hardest challenges that we face in terms of how are we going to reimagine the internet and all of the different social institutions that it touches and do this with some kind of integrity and some kind of th thought process that can be replicated. And um, so, Today, as we sort of debate the ins and outs of what it means to describe news content online, I'm really hoping that you all take some time to ask really hard questions because this, is, this project is only really going to get better the more people that participate in it. So I'm really looking forward to your questions. 
Thanks, Joan. So I, uh, I'm going to kick this off with some research uh, the CJF just conducted in uh, collaboration with Mary Matchbooks, Bax, uh, a research firm, to take the pulse of Canadians and Americans on news consumption, trust in the media, and perceptions of uh, fake news in the lead up to two major elections in our countries. Uh, can we, I guess we've queued the slides. So um, we looked at a sample of 1,500 Canadians, uh, a represented sample of 1,500 Canadians and Americans. Uh, and if, we're, if we turn first to news consumption, uh, and this is very consistent with a lot of the results uh, we've seen from um, concurrent polls, TV and traditional sources are still um, a popular source of news in the US. Uh, while radio um, is more popular in Canada. Uh, people are consuming more news on social media. Millennials uh, tend to tap a lot of news sources, and 73% um, in Canada and 68% in the US are getting their news uh, from social media. In terms of trust in news, uh, social media and podcasts are the most trusted sources in the US and radio still has a higher trust value in Canada. Trust in social media is higher among millennials, no surprise, uh, with 60% trusting what they read in the US versus 36% per, uh, in Canada um, trusting those news sources. It's no surprise that political news dominates um, our perceptions of, of where we're more likely, to, uh, where it's more likely to be most vulnerable to misinformation uh, in both of our populations. Um, both populations can also agree that fake news is a big issue in the lead up to the US election in 2020. Misinformation, um, the perception from Canadians is it's far more common uh, in the US. But there's also some good news uh, in this slide. 91% of Canadians and Americans can agree that a free press is essential to democracy. Uh, two thirds in both countries believe that journalists have a high degree of integrity, but that no media organization can be uh, completely impartial. Uh, this slide is most, I found the most interesting. Half of the Americans surveyed in this poll uh, are more likely to believe that they can easily spot fake news, while 37% uh, of Canadians say that they struggle with this. And a high percentage in both countries uh, are paying more attention uh, to news than ever before. So uh, conclusions, as I said, this is consistent with research uh, we've seen recently. Social media is changing our relationship with the news. And while it's become a more common source of news and information, people are less trusting of what they find there. So the balance will depend on that, um, uh, the, the balance between trust uh, and engagement as we go forward. And uh, both Canada and the US are concerned about misinformation in the lead up to our elections. And clearly we do see some gaps. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dwight to talk a bit about uh, what they're doing at Credco and uh, a model for a nutrition label for news. <coughs> Thanks, Natalie. If we can just um, switch the uh, slides over, that'd be great. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, CREDCO is an initiative. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary group of journalists, researchers, technologists uh, coming together to really, uh, to really figure out uh, what is uh, credible news and information online, how can we define that, um, and, and what are the standards around credibility, can we create those? Um, so we're an initiative uh, led by uh, two 501c3s, me, Dan, uh, Ed Beist, our CEO, is here. Um, uh, which makes uh, fact-checking tools for journalists, including Check, which we use, a terrific uh, platform, and Hacks Hackers, which produces the MissInfoCon, uh, the MissInfoCon gatherings around the world. There's been five so far, um, two in London, one in Kiev, and, and uh, one in DC as well. So I highly encourage you, if there, there are going to be future MissInfoCons in the future, I highly encourage you all to, uh, to go to those. So really, as I said, uh, this was started at the first MissInfoCon uh, at the MIT Media Lab in February 2018. And we, we really, you know, we posed one question. How can we support a collaborative approach towards solving information disorder issues? Um, you know, we, we thought it would be interesting if we had a computer scientist, a journalist, 
uh, a sociologist and citizens brainstorming to think of, you know, what, what are the different approaches uh, that, we can, you know, that, that we can take to solve this problem uh, in a collaborative, friendly space? Because we found that, you know, there, there aren't a lot of organizations or groups that are doing this, really bringing everyone together in a holistic way to talk about how we can solve information disorder issues. And we want to we wanna address three things uh, uh, primarily. So assess, can we agree on the indicators for reliable information online? Scaling, does it work at small and large magnitudes and an application? How can the implementation of credibility standards effectively inform people? So how do we establish a common cause, uh, a common vocabulary? We also work with the World Wide Web Consortium, Sandro Hawk, uh, the W3C, to establish credibility vocabulary and definitions on the web. What are the different signals? What are the different indicators uh, that we can define uh, for credible news and information online? Because if there's no standards, we can't get any work done. And it's kind of like the wild, wild west right now with standards. It, we, we need the tech platforms and organizations to agree uh, on standards, on the basic standards, because if we don't do that, we can't get any work done in a meaningful way. And so this is really, this, is, this slide's key because this is what Credco does that differentiates us uh, from all the other uh, organizations in the field. Um, so we're, we are not a thumbs up, thumbs down scoring system, which is why this panel is super interesting about the nutrition label because actually it's not Credco's idea, um, but it's something that we want to explore and figure out whether other folks are behind it. But this is really what Credco does. So you take a story of unassessed credibility on the left, and we're in the blue section over there, and we, we have humans, uh, human annotation efforts uh, where they go through articles and, and we pay journalism students from around the country, including uh, the very talented journalism students at the ASU Cronkite School of, of uh, Journalism, uh, to, to annotate articles based on specific content and context indicators. And then, you, and then collecting, we collect all that data. And so then we have troves of valuable data we can license out to tech platforms and give out to researchers to inform everyone's work in the field. And so by doing this, we're providing us a great service to the community because they can interpret that data to help inform their research around misinformation, which is really, really interesting. And so on the right, uh, folks, different folks can interpret that data, use that to score credibility on the web, in particular with those specific stories, and have algorithmic transparency, and then hopefully use that to assess credible versus non-credible stories, um, and, and, and perhaps using AI, they can use AI machine learning in the future as well. That's, that's far down the line, um, but that, that would be a long-term goal of ours as well. And so these are some of the indicators that we're trying to, uh, that we're trying to test for, that we do test for, uh, with journalism students and annotators uh, around the country. So if you see on the left, the context-based, content-based indicators, title representatives, title representativeness, um, clickbait title, how clickbaity a title is, logical fallacies, uh, quotes from outside experts, on the, on the right, you can see context-based indicators, uh, has it been fact-checked, uh, how many, what are the ads like? What are the number of ads? Are there calls to share this on social? Are there aggressive calls to share this on social? Um, are there aggressive ads? Where are the ads placed? So this is the kind of stuff that we test for. And it's really interesting because we, we accept new, we can test any indicators and signals. So we, folks come to us and say, hey, can you test this indicator? And we can do that. We just plug it right into our program. Uh, and then we can, we can gather the data based on whatever indicator and signal we want to test for. We use check uh, to test for um, context-based uh, indicators, and this is a t the uh, a tool of Medan, uh, which is, which is I'm, I'm biased, but this is a terrific platform, and we use this uh, uh, very thoroughly and comprehensively to, to have annotators really go through these articles and answer uh, very detailed questions um, around, uh, you know, around, around the indicators that I just described to you. Our first paper, led by Amy Zhang, uh, was, was published in uh, 20, 2018 uh, with MIT, and some of our findings were really, really interesting. So we found that some indicators, so, we, so basically we analyzed 50 climate and science related uh, articles using those indicators that I had up on the screen before. And we found that some do correlate with credibility, such as the representatives, representativeness of citations as outside sources and the clickbait assessment uh, of a title. So some of, these are some of these are not surprising, and some of these are surprising. 
Um, so the entity's assessment of ad placement as aggressive does suggest a difference between credible and non-credible content. Um, if ads are kind of in your face uh, and, and, uh, and, and meant to distract you and super, super aggressive, that does correlate with credibility. Again, not, not necessarily surprising, but interesting. And the quantity of ads, content recommendation boxes, and sponsored content do not have a significant correlation with credibility, which we found somewhat surprising. And so what we did was we had, um, we had environmental experts go through these articles and then rate them on a simple five-point scale um, of, of credibility. Uh, and what we found is that we ask annotators uh, before they annotate the articles and after uh, how credible they find the, uh, they find the articles. And we found that um, after they answered the annotation questions that we, that we provided them based on these specific indicators, they're, uh, they're basically the way they, they, um, they, the, the way they rated the articles based on uh, credibility aligned more closely with the expert scores after they went through check and after they answered the questions. So we find this all the time that journalism students, uh, you know, they, they, they think that this is really, really helpful to their studies as well. Um, and they're developing their critical thinking skills and using this uh, in an advantageous way with their studies. And so, like I said, nutrition label, it's not Credco's idea. And honestly, we're not a thumbs up, thumbs down scoring system, as I said before. But this, uh, this nutrition label was started by, uh, this, this specific uh, concept was started by Matt Stempek at MIT in 2011. And this is something, you know, we, we just want to explore and, and see if it's a good idea. Um, what's the protein, fat, or salt when it comes to information quality? What percentage ranges are healthy uh, or nourishing? And so, you know, what, what we want to do is, is we want to have a robust discussion today and we want to hear from you all and, and, and uh, I echo Joan's sentiments with, uh, with uh, we want to hear from you all and, and to see what you think about this idea. And so it's going to be a really interesting discussion. So that's, that's basically what uh, Credco is and, um, and I look forward to the discussion and, and hearing from all of you. So please don't be shy later in the session. So Dwight, let's open with that. Uh, nutrition Labels for News, is this uh, a good idea? And I'm going to throw that to our panel. Who's up? Go for it. Go for it. All right. No? I'm, all right. I, um, I start with the attitude that uh, any that we should try everything, uh, that we are uh, pretty far behind the bad actors who are, are amazingly quicker at taking advantage of uh, technology and platforms and uh, new ways of communication than the people uh, who, in my view, are uh, more credible and have more integrity. So these kinds of things are wonderful. I'm uh, very glad that Dwight's not talking about a thumbs up, thumbs down, green light, red light system. Uh, those things, which, at some level are better than nothing. Uh, I mean, nothing at all may be worse than something like that, but these things are so easily gamed. And the uh, people who want a sort of yes, no, binary kind of thing are inviting trouble down the road, so we don't want that. Um, I think this is really important work uh, that is, as Dwight just said, at the very early stages. A couple of things that I, I think we have to keep in mind as we proceed with this is that all of us in the room here are immersed in the world of communications and journalism in many, many cases. Uh, so we spend all day thinking about these things. We, we're, we're pretty careful about assessing things ourselves. We have to keep in mind that this is, in the end, this is aiming to help uh, everybody simply have better information environments and that most people uh, have jobs and families and lives uh, and they don't have much time. And any solutions that we try to come up with, if they don't take into account the fact that uh, the, that regular people in the world are not deep into this the way we are and don't have the time to put into it, then I'm concerned. 
that we might fail because it's just too cumbersome. So let, let's keep that one going. If, if it becomes a lot of work for the users, uh, they're not going to do it. The, and, and I do want to come back to the question of the, the bad actors. Uh, you know, I'm sure they've read that paper really carefully uh, and are thinking how they get around any things that might uh, tend to work in this category. So we, we have to be better at anticipating what they're going to do and think of this as, uh, it, we use arms race as a, uh, an analogy. It's also chess and we have to think a few more moves ahead than we've been doing. I'll, I'll stop there. So some of my thoughts on this are really about where we put our ideas about assessments at the forefront of the content and how that, so I study what you would call bad actors online, right? I, deeping this stuff day in and day out. And I just read an article yesterday um, on Breitbart, which is a known fake news warehouse, right? And it was about the migration issues and what they were pushing for politically was for the Department of Homeland Security in the US to have more discretionary power to immediately either detain or deport particular people that they um, find have immigration issues in the US. And in the article, um, one thing that would have tripped up this algorithm is they were using an expert from Princeton. And I was like, who this, right? <laughs> Hello. And so I look up the guy and he actually works for a, a policy think tank that that's, uh, has Princeton in the title. But it's not Princeton University, it's just Princeton, New Jersey, right? <laughs> And I, you know, you bet your dollars to donuts that part of the reason why Princeton was used without um, a link to the actual think tank was to give an air of authority. And so what I worry about is the way in which when we start to automate some of these systems, how easily switches like that will get turned into positive scores. And... It, only through the careful vetting of someone like me who says, I, I don't think so. This, it, this doesn't seem like something an expert from Princeton University would say is going to dig deeper. And so I think that you're right in the sense that we have to think about um, our almost begin our analysis from these fringe groups or these outsider places and figure out what their tactics are before we start to assess things that we maybe already um, imagine as having quality because there's uh, a news organization behind it that has uh, many, many years of trusted, um, you know, <laughs> content. Uh, maybe what we do is start to think with these edge cases in the center and like really see if we can figure out how to bust this system before it gets rolled out because I think that unless we're like seriously what you might call red teaming or quality checking the system against things that are egregious, egregious misuses, it's gonna, it's gonna be a difficult thing to, um, to implement. The other thing that I worry about a little bit with this model is that one of the things that the research points to is that the more people know about what to assess in an article, the more critical of a reader they become. Right, so this to me kind of points to a kind of media literacy that we haven't really developed as global readers of the internet, right? Maybe we've given a little bit too much credit to the internet as a place to get verifiable information and potentially then what that means to me isn't necessarily a shift in, oh, we need to educate everyone or we need better media literacy, but I think we do need a kind of librarianship for the internet or a, uh, information managers that can help aggregate news sources and create um, really like a knowledge bank or a knowledge commons that has at the front end of that spectrum that you're showing many more people at the front end making assessments, actual people, and doing this on the daily 
and worrying less about the AI and the automation at the end, right? And so I, I, I wonder if there's a way in which nutrition labels um, could be less automated, <coughs> but serve to help us understand um, better the assessments of the human moderators at the, at the front end of your, your scale here. <coughs> I, I, can I just add something? Um, we, Dwight used a word that's crucial in this, and that's scale. Uh, and humans don't scale. If, if as, as trying to intervene with humans, unless we just hire or somehow add a lot. And I, I love what you are talking about, uh, John. I think that would be a wonderful idea. This idea of a uh, librarianship is fabulous. My only wonder is who's going to do it? Who are we, how are we going to uh, compensate them? And, and, does, and how do we make that idea scale widely? Uh, so I, I'm, I'm hearing things I love, I just don't see how they... I mean, I see a role for professional, a professional organization, you know, related to maybe even the ALA here, the American Library Association, mm -hmm. or um, I'm sure there's a European equivalent as well as uh, many other equivalents. I think that we've forgotten a lot about what originally made the internet great, which is the internet as we know it was built by information people. Mm. I'm thinking here about Brewster Kahle and the early version of search engines that were meant to be like pay phones, <laughs> right? You were supposed, it was gonna cost you. They were, they were, they were debating uh, some of the early internet designers is it too much to have someone pay a nickel or a quarter per search return? And mainly they were thinking about if you were to search for a docket or a case number as if the internet was a law library and then it would return to you the information that you sought, um, but it would charge you per, per return. And you would be a lot more reticent to just go search for anything, right? Uh, you, would, you would think a lot about what it, what it might return because you don't want to incur so many charges. And so the idea of the internet built upon a telecom system that required you to think both at the front end and then also uh, information retrieval was considered the most valuable service that the internet could provide, is that it could provide you credible information. And so I think there is a question about scale that also has to do with the responsibilities of business as well as what we want from the internet. And if we want the internet to have credible, knowledgeable information, that is way more expensive than free information. But we see what the effects of free information are right now where we have, you know, I mean, global governance is tilting not just to the right, but to populism, to the far right. And this is not necessarily um, an artifact or a natural outgrowth of the internet. It's an outgrowth of when you allow scale to happen without any, um, without any guardrails, without any concern for what uh, the quality of the information flows are. And if that's the internet that we get, or the internet that we deserve, because we aren't, we're more worried about scale than we are about quality, then this is going to continue. Beat you up, you should talk. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think Joan made a lot of very good points, and I just want to go quickly back to what you said. Um, and I, th I think what you're saying is there's nuance, um, and there's there's a ton of nuance in these these articles and you, you really, you know, that can really only be assessed by humans and because we were talking earlier about, um, for example, comment sections and analyzing comment sections in articles and pick, they, you know, the machine, machines can pick up uh, words like trans um, and, and uh, use that as, uh, with negative connotations. And so it, there's, there's a lot of stuff here that really, that really machines can't do right now, AI machine, AI machine learning can't do right now, and only humans can do. Um, 
uh, which is which is something that we really need to focus on and what we're focusing on at Creco as well um, over the next 5, 10, 15 years because um, because this is something that could really get get out of hand. And we have to get in front of this um, at the front end because this is this is something that really, really um, could be dangerous. It's already having dramatic effects um, in the news media ecosystem and we really we really have to get in front of it. But uh, you know, I, for, for this nutrition label, for example, with partisan rhetoric, I really want to go there because, uh, you, you know, I, at least in the States, and, and I know this is true in Italy, um, I don't know the specific news outlets, but in the States, you know, you have, you have media outlets on the left, uh, you have media outlets in the center, and then you, you do, you, you know, you have some on the right, like Fox News, uh, Breitbart, Drudge. And then if you go even further on the right, you have um, extremist websites, and by the way, Joan does a lot of uh, incredible, amazing work around fighting uh, white nationalism and extremism online. She's on the front lines every day, so thank you for doing that, Joan. We all really appreciate that. Um, but how, how, how do you even use uh, a label like partisan rhetoric um, if, you're, if you're talking about fringe conspiracy theory uh, uh, extremist websites but you know, not, not only on the right, but on the left as well. Um, and how, how do you how do you even uh, use a label like this if 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 you know we you know if there are, if there are no standards to, to bring everyone together? Mm -hmm. Got to be careful about uh, labels like this being forced into a false equivalence, uh, you know, a balance thing. As you're pointing out, this, there's a difference between partisan and extremist. And I don't think the early uh, versions of this are gonna catch that. It's a, it's a really difficult problem. And again, I, I mean, this is incredibly important work and it, the, there's a lot of promise in here. I just don't, I, I worry about if, whether we can capture on a front end system the kind of nuance that uh, we wanna provide for people. If it's a, the nutrition label on food in the U.S. has some value, and uh, but that's a you know you're shopping maybe a couple of times a week, and you know if you buy a lot of fresh food that's not processed, then you don't have to worry about it very much, uh, and you don't have to spend a lot of time on it. But this is a are we going to use are we going to delve into every article uh, as a as a reader or viewer or listener? It's it just feels I, I'm I'm worried about the time factor too and just the, the attention of people. So I have a couple of different thoughts on this. One is again I, I'm sorry I'm like obsessed with internet history, so we got to go a little bit further back. We got to we got to start thinking about why does everything anybody posts online count as news anyway? Right, so you can, uh, you know, using a website, you know, get a, a webcam and, uh, you know, take pictures of your cat and say, breaking news, you know, cat eats at five, mm -hmm. right? And because of the way the internet is structured, we're allowed to add our own metadata and our own tags to things. And Facebook's um, way in which you can even code pages allows you to just say, yeah, my page is a news page. but when it comes to the kinds of civil liberties and the kinds of rights we ascribe to journalists, that gets really muddy. So in the moment, um, which I'm sure many of you have lived through, the moment where all blogs became news, right? In this weird way, like all bloggers became journalists, that did a lot to deprofessionalize de the field of journalism. And so the way in which the internet has been allowed to uh, sort of destabilize all of our cherished social institutions that do require some kind of hierarchy, some kind of formalism, some kind of professionalization, I think is a big mistake, right? And so if I'm allowed to write online that, you know, my website about my cat is a news website, then it stands to reason that my website about my far-right extremist group is also news right, or newsworthy in some ways. And so um, that's where I think also groups that are extremist groups really leverage that gap online and say, 
Well, you know, we might be in a, you know, they might even admit that they're a far right group. Maybe they even will, uh, in some instances, admit that they tilt towards fascism, but they'll say, well, that's a valid viewpoint. It's the same as any other kind of political viewpoint. And it's like, in my mind, if you are calling for the eradication of different races based on some kind of gen uh, like genocidal rage, then you don't count as a journalist and we need to have like ways of protecting against that. And it's not just enough to say, oh, well, it's partisan, it's, or a hyper-partisan. We have to actually have assessments of, you know, and to my mind, good and evil, right? Where, I mean, we're in the, the house of the holy, it seems here, I don't know. Yeah, it, <laughs> I don't go to church very often. It could be, this could be a museum, I can't tell. If, um, but I, I, but John, like, John, bloggers didn't become journalists. This was, that, that I was there for that, mm -hmm argument and it was always a bad argument it was it, I'm I don't think it is useful to say who a journalist is the only useful construction is what is journalism and we've let that go and we're we get outside of the uh, the, the core of this if we think about who is the journalist I just want to I, I, the, the nutrition label for me if it if it says this is journalism even partisan journalism, uh, and and I certainly would separate, you know, fascism from almost everything else. Uh, but this is a. I, I, I want to get back to the sort of it, what is the core of the thing we think of as journalism in a if this is a news context that he's using. Okay, so let's take the news context. Um, uh, so. So there's, we, we have to address the blurring of the lines between news and entertainment, I think, even with journalistic institutions. So Fox News is the number one uh, source of news for Americans in the US. I mean, we have tens of millions of Americans watching uh, basically what is a White House propaganda machine uh, every night. And so you have folks like uh, uh, Lou Dobbs uh, and Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson, um, yeah, uh, you know, and really, really espousing uh, White House views and conservative, very, very conservative opinions that align, that align with the Trump administration, uh, masquerading as news. And so I think, I think it's really, really important. Fox News has done an, an incredibly effective job of doing this, really blurring the lines between news and entertainment. So a lot of folks are watching channels like this thinking they're getting news, but what it really is is um, very specific uh, opinionated viewpoints that a lot of people probably perceive uh, as straight news. I mean, what is their catchphrase still fair and balanced? I mean, I, you know, it's, well, I, that was that was always a, actually that was two lies in three words. But the when I write about Fox News, I put news in quotes. I encourage you to do the same. Right. Yeah, and that and that to me, like, is some that is like uh, you know, if the word here is nuance or context setting, that. Um, like can only be done or assessed by a human who sees how this plays out in real world effects, right? Right now online, there is a battle over Tucker Carlson's reputation because white nationalists are coming out saying, Tucker Carlson is better at espousing our points about our political platform better than we are because we get into the genocidal rage stuff, <laughs> but he can keep it at a level where it can act um, sort of as an undercurrent to his reporting. And so I think that being able to capture even beyond the article, something about the way in which the news is circulating would also add some kind of value to uh, a labeling schema, which I think can only come from professors and experts kind of writing more holistically. But at the end of, you know, like we have to put our foot down at some point. I agree with you that um, the question about who are journalists versus what is journalism, I think that's an important one to answer because my news that I get, the news I trust most, is generally from first person protest reporting. So I like to watch live streams of, of rallies and protests. And when I saw that video of the Covington Catholic confrontation between that indigenous man, uh, that indigenous man and, that, and that high school student, I knew immediately that there was something else going on that was broader 
And, but because not many people had the context of how these protests often play out and have these highly contentious confrontational moments, that it was going to be used to drive a partisan wedge um, because it was a clip that was poorly uh, introduced to the world. But that fits in the category of wait before you believe anything. Mm -hmm. And you can't, w w this is one of our problems, we're wired, literally wired in our brains uh, for fast response and we shouldn't, we, we have to, we should force ourselves to take a breath. That's where, that's, I mean, that almost feels impossible with, with, um, with Twitter. I mean, the advent of Twitter over the past uh, 10, 15 years, I mean, it, it, it's just, we have, there's an oversaturation of news these days, and our instinctual response, you're right, is to share things well, we, before, before, you know, really processing them, we can, and that's highly destructive. That we, can be can, highly, highly destructive. Yeah, but we can, we can learn to, we can learn to hold on for a second. How? how, do, how? Well, we, how, how we, we seem to, we, we've got, we have students we talk about this with, and they uh, increasingly don't trust uh, breaking news. And that's, I think, is a wonderful thing. It totally is. I wish, I wish everyone could, could go through that training. I wish everyone could do that. Well, then we have to make that scale, too. Anyway. So, Dan, to talk about that point, we have a Canadian academic uh, called Gordon Pennycook, and he just had an op-ed in the New York Times, Why Do People Fall for Fake News? And he puts it down to... Um, Laziness, mental laziness, not bias. So we're not spending the time, you know, as Dan has said, reading the news before before sharing this. I want to sort of take this to to our audience because we are running out of time, and we've we've covered a lot of ground. We've covered the landscape. Uh, we've covered uh, how we could scale this, the times people spend uh, reading news, the importance of a human element. Uh, how uh, this would apply to all of our stakeholders, tech platforms, and publishers. So I want to put it to the audience, is this a schema um, that you think could be useful in the landscape, in the ecosystem for news literacy, and open it up to our audience for questions? We have someone with a microphone, so... Hi, thank you so much for doing this panel. Um, my name is Juliana von Record bismarck and I run a, an NGO, a journalist-led NGO called Lie Detectors. I, I really love the idea of nutrition labels. I'm a great fan of Steve Brill's NewsGuard. Can you hear me? Um, I think it's very gutsy. Um, what we do is we train journalists to go into schools and have a face-to-face -face conversation with children aged 10 to 15 about disinformation, but then also about how journalism works. And by um, connecting with them, we see what they read and what they view and everything, and we see that um, a lot of this stuff, they, 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 they consume the information, they consume it not via text, but via video, and if they do read, it's very often via Instagram, which is, you know, JPEGs and pixels rather than text, right? So my question to you who are working and thinking about nutrition labels is, how do you, you know, how, what are you thinking about, what can be, how can you apply your thinking to the area where AI will fail because you can't track pixels, right? And human moderators do not exist because, you know, we're talking about private groups, Snapchat groups, Zuckerberg is talking about creating a, a digital living room. How, you know, how, what are you thinking, how can you apply what you do right now to that area where AI and human moderators cannot really penetrate? Thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, look, it's a tough question. I can tell you what certain tech platforms are doing, and, and um, you know, I, I know that uh, WhatsApp, I, recently a ton of misinformation uh, spreads on WhatsApp. Uh, Medan's working on this uh, around elections, and, uh, you know, an amazing, an amazing amount of misinformation and disinformation spreads via, uh, via social media networks like Snap and WhatsApp, and I know WhatsApp just recently enacted policies to make it um, impossible to uh, forward certain messages uh, past a certain number of folks, so they count the number of people you can forward the messages to. And also you can set up, like Medan does, around uh, uh, elections in Mexico for uh, last year and in India coming up this year, um, what they do is they set up a text hotline where you can quickly text uh, text this a specific number and get a fact check verification very quickly. So that's I mean that, you know look, but I, regarding video and and pixels, that's really tough. You have content moderators. Uh, uh, 
you know, a, a, around the world trying to solve this problem, and it's really, really complex. And I don't know if there's a simple answer to it. I just don't. I don't, I don't know if there's a simple answer. It's because you're right, visualization and, and you know, you, the tech platforms have to do a better job. The tech platforms have to do a better job and they have to do more. And Joan, places like Instagram and Snap where students are getting the news, can this scale to, to that? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, even before we get to apps, it's YouTube, it's YouTube, yeah. it's YouTube, yeah. right? So the number two search engine next to Google is YouTube. And so if I am a teenager and I'm about to write a school report, I go to YouTube, right? And so if you're a, a student and you're trying to do, say you got an assignment, you gotta figure out what happened during World War II, right? So you're like, maybe I'll catch a doc on YouTube, just skip reading, you know, even Wikipedia. And you go into a rabbit hole full of Holocaust denialism, right? Because those videos are prevalent and popular. And so there's this one uh, video in particular, a six hour documentary that lots of young people share because it's got a very mimetic title. I'm not gonna say it here because uh, I, don't, I actually don't wanna spread the meme. But if you watch this movie, there are viewing parties of this documentary amongst teens across different Google Hangouts and things and as they watch this, then they incorporate it into their language and their, you know, but then, but at the end of the day, what they learn is that there was a widespread government conspiracy to pretend the Holocaust happened and that it's being taught in schools so that, um, you know, for the continuation of a, you know, an, a very anti-Semitic uh, rationale. But the students don't, re they don't know, they don't have history by their side to debunk this as they do it, right? And so it's not even that news is the problem, but it's also just the historical context under which we have allowed these things to proliferate unchecked for many, many, many years. And then the other thing that I see being leveraged on YouTube is that lots of these far right people hold daily uh, streams that are news aggregator type shows where they'll read articles to the audience, like they'll read parts of the articles of, you know, from Vox or from Quartz and they will make jokes about the sort of liberal media. And so what you get mixed in there in YouTube with your news is a very heavy handed far right analysis, right? And we don't see this happening. Um, on the left or far left. It's just not that popular, this style of show. And so um, the world that I live in, the place where I find all of this stuff is deeply, deeply traumatic. And I think for, for children to have, you know, to be able, the, the way in which children are interacting with the news, it's, it goes beyond just um, like Instagram. It goes beyond Snapchat. But I think at the root of it, if we really wanted to change that culture, it would be to start with YouTube. I, I will say those are very, very good points. I agree with everything Joan said. Um, taking it a step down from extremism uh, uh, and just talking about misinformation, one thing I have seen YouTube do um, is I, I've somehow stumbled upon a video of Scott Pruitt, our uh, the former EPA uh, administrator, disgraced EPA administrator in the U.S., talking about how CO2 doesn't cause, doesn't contribute to climate change. And right underneath the video, um, there was YouTube put a link to the Wikipedia article for climate change, which was which was an interesting um, an interesting method of of saying, hey, what this what this guy's saying is possibly not true. I mean, what he's saying, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's not true, but. We have a question over here. Oh, here first, first. yes. Yeah. Uh, Dale Bechtel, I'm the, can you hear me? Executive editor of the uh, International Service of the Swiss Broadcast, a uh, public broadcaster. Um, Natalie, I'll quickly, just for clarification, you said that approximately in the U.S. and Canada, 70% get their news from social media. Is social media the only source in that case? Um, the main source or just one of so many? We were, we were talking about traditional sources, TV, mm -hmm. 
being more popular in the U.S., radio has traditionally um, been been a, a more popular source uh, in Canada, and uh, we were looking at uh, an increase in trust in both social media and podcasts in the U.S., uh, where Canada, um, our trusted sources, again, consistently has been radio. Uh, in this last poll that we did, and if that uh, okay, is that so, the it's slide? one of many. I think the slide just went past too quickly earlier. Thank you, and and yeah. to, to Joan, um, there is a librarian. It's Google. Mm -hmm. I think we all know that. To to your question on that, but what I'd really like to know with with this very interesting nutritional label, um, we also heard the other day from um, um, Sally Lehrman of the the Trust Project. Has there been a response from from Google in the sense of a conversation with you, looking at how the research you're doing can help float to the top more reputable news sites? Let me tell you, two years ago, Google uh, um, wouldn't make any assessments about quality. They surfaced 4chan uh, at, right after there was a mass shooting in Las Vegas. I believe 60 people died. Um, and someone who was related to the family of the shooter was initially identified as the suspect and this person's life was, was destroyed by um, people online wanting to self-investigate. So when you Googled that person's name, that misidentification, on Google News showed up links to 4chan and then you were set to go contextualize it yourself. Um, since then, there have been many programmatic algorithmic changes to Google and they just yesterday were talking about well the news we're going to serve first is going to be news that we have partnerships with because this can't keep happening right and um, you know I think they're finally starting to realize that their algorithm being so predictable means that it's easily harnessed and turned against them. Uh, so that's one huge change that's happened over two years in this as a result of research saying you have to think about quality. You can't just let the algorithm be the editor. The other thing that's a, uh, a commentary on uh, two years ago, South by Southwest, uh, Susan Wojcicki of YouTube said, YouTube's like a library, guys. Like, just think about it like a library. I, it is at best a dumpster on fire. Right? I mean, the librarians are not going to let you walk into the library and be like, on display, Mein Kampf. You know, get your guns and ammo magazine over here. Librarians serve a critical public function. We have turned librarians, in the U.S. at least, into um, babysitters, like childcare after school, basically, and, uh, you know, helping the homeless in a lot of ways. We have underutilized this, re this massive resource that has uh, a building in every city, <laughs> right? I mean, the infrastructure is there. The way in which we use it, though, when we move into the digital, it's almost as if we forget that we have many, many legions of information professionals that would never allow not just the metadata structure on YouTube to stand, but they would also insist that quality came first and not just everything for everyone and whatever happens, so be it. We have time for one more question and uh, we have one here in the front. Hi, uh, Nick Newman from the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Thanks for the discussion, it was really uh, interesting. Um, yeah, I'm coming back to really the issue of scale, and I think you know the discussion about Instagram and YouTube just shows how difficult this is going to be at an item level, let alone taking this to other countries. I mean, most of the discussion has been the very particular and difficult situation in the US, but obviously, how do you scale that to hundreds of countries around the world? So I'm wondering if you know the, the, the key thing is what can we do and what should platforms do? What guidance should we give to platforms so that they can do stuff at an item level based on some some guidance that we can give people about what quality might look like. So I'm wondering whether we should really focus on this issue of um, journalist uh, production of, of high quality journalistic content, in other words, on the brand that is producing it, the intent, and try to categorize that, because that at least feels more manageable than trying to get down to the item level, and at least you can hold 
to account journalists and editors who, who publish these policies about how well they have delivered against those policies. Would that not be something? That's part of, that's part of what we need to do, but we have to address the demand side or, or we can't make this work at all. If we have all the good journalism in the world, what we know is that the bad actors have figured out how to scale what they do. The deceit scales apparently better than truth at the moment and people who are the users of information, we call them readers or viewers or whatever, and I think we use media, we don't just consume it and we, we have to help them. What I want from the platforms in particular is to give users better tools to make their own algorithms, which of course challenges the business model, but I want to keep working on that. I think too there's a, a, a paper or some kind of, maybe it's a blog post uh, out of Berkman Center for Internet, and the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, I think it's written by Jonathan Zittrain, about uh, recipes for your news feed. So, uh, you might, uh, he, you know, they propose a few different models. One is that, oh, you know, you like, you would put into the recipe, you know, you want to see 15% uh, friends and family, 25% news and commentary, 30% sports, and you can shape your own news feed based on this, like, recipe, or you can copy someone else's. So someone else might have spent a lot of time cultivating what they want their news feed to be online, and you can kind of copy their recipe. And I think things like that where we actually use the tools of programmatic yeah. uh, algorithms and are allowed to shape them gives the consumer at least, if anything, the illusion of choice. But the functional reason why we don't as consumers have control over that is because no one would choose, you know, 60% advertising, right? right. Um, and so the way in which the advertising shows up is also something we didn't get into, but it would be troubleson for news uh, uh, labeling too because the boosted posts, anyone can boost a post, anyone can promote a tweet. Uh, that way in which that instantaneous advertising has played out in the news sphere has been has been pretty egregiously abused by um, what we might call uh, mid tier or small market press that is hyper partisan. So uh, that puts us at time. I want to thank Joan, Dwight, and Dan for sharing their insights. Thank all of you uh, for your questions. Uh, if you do want to delve uh, more into some of these conversations, Dwight and Joan and Dan will be right here in the hall, but we do have to, uh, have to move on. And I'm happy to post those, uh, those slides on this session so that we can spend more time on them. So thanks to all of you for joining us for this session. That was well done. Thank well, you. It's, it's you and I are...